I'm really excited to uh, be sharing this morning. I feel it's a little while since I've had the opportunity to speak in the AM, so I'm, I'm really excited about it. Uh, and maybe a little bit nervous. I did rewrite my message three times yesterday. So hopefully, hopefully, <laughs> I'm really just believing that, that God's gonna speak to us this morning. Uh, where are the parents at this morning? Where, where are our parents? They're all quiet because they're running on three hours sleep, but they're here. Um, I think one of the great joys of being a parent is, is when you get to give your kids something new, whether it's a gift or a toy. Isn't it just the most beautiful feeling to see your kid's face light up when you give them a gift of some description? The, the way that they, they just instantly, it's like, I love this with, with all of my being. I think it's interesting that kids seem to treat toys like people. Um, have you noticed that? Like, it's like, oh, now, now that I have this new doll, it must sleep in my bed. It must have a blanket on. It can't be cold at any time. I, I think it, it's like the, the, the movie Toy Story really wrecked me as a child because I was no longer able to see toys as objects. They were now people. And is that anyone else or is that just me? I, I really have a hard time throwing things out because I'm like, I don't want poor Woody to, you know, go into the incinerator or, or whatever it is. The, the issue I found with toys is toys break. And as high of a feeling as it is when your kids get a new toy, it, it is mirrored when a toy that they love breaks, right? When, when something they care about is broken. And, and you can see as it breaks on their face that their eyes begin to well up, their, their lips beque- begin to quiver. And, and the parental response is to, to dive in and to say, it's okay, we can fix it. Right? Any parents here, let's be honest, you've lied to your kid. Like, <laughs> we can fix this, but you're like, it's gone. <laughs> but we, we can fix, I'm sure we, we can find a way to, to fix this. I, I found myself in this situation um, just over the weekend, actually. Uh, one of the toys had broken and it ended up on my workbench. And I don't know, yeah, yeah, we can fix this. And as I began to look at it and, and think about how to fix this, I thought, I can't fix this. <laughs> I was looking at it and I was like, I do not have the skill set required to fix this. I, I thought I could put a few screws in it and it might work. Turns out I probably need to weld something. I don't know how to weld. I, I lived in Taiwan for six years. They don't teach welding over there. I mean, <laughs> when we were living in Taiwan, we had to borrow a drill off someone's friend's dad to be able to fix something at church because no one had any power tools. And so I, I'm not skilled enough. And, and I looked at this broken it like a little cot and I thought it would be so much easier just to throw this out and get a new one and replace the broken thing with something that was new and I think in many ways we live in a society where that's very normal right it's often easier to dispose of something and get something new than it is to actually fix things we used to kind of be in this culture, I suppose, of where things would, would fix, something would last you your whole life, but now we're in the, the disposable razor culture where it's, I use it a couple of times, I throw it away, it's done. And, and as I was fixing this toy, well, not fixing it, sorry, as I was looking at this toy, I, I, I kind of had the thought that I'm so glad that when God looks at me, He doesn't think, um, He doesn't treat me as single use or disposable. He doesn't look at me and see my brokenness and think, I'll just get another one. He doesn't look at me and think, okay, we'll replace this with something new and something better. Isn't it good news that we're not disposable to God? And at times though, because at times, I can relate to the broken toy that's sitting on the workbench where something's not gone right, I've, I've done something or I've said something or I've thought something and I, I find myself in a place where it would just be easier to start again. I don't know if you've ever felt like that, but gee, it'd be great to just have a do-over, to, to just a, a little fresh restart. I think that's why the, the whole sea change thing is so big. It's like, I'm just gonna move to Mount Isa because that'll fix all my problems or uh, I'm gonna move to the beach because I just need a, a fresh start. I think sometimes I relate to the brokenness of this toy. It'd be easier to start again. I feel like I should just maybe throw in the towel. Maybe my purpose has been served. Maybe you've actually felt like I'm broken beyond repair. But thank God, 
that we're not single use and that there's always more for us. And that even when it seems finished, God's not done yet. Turn the person beside you and say, God's not done yet. And just to be fair, turn to the person on the other side and say the same thing, just in case they were sitting on the end and they didn't have anyone to say it to. God's not done yet. At the moment, we've been kind of in our morning services, we've been tracking through the period between Easter um, and Pentecost, which is 50 days after, after Easter. And we're, we're kind of looking at some of the stories that happen in between, the stories when Jesus is appearing to people in His resurrection, resurrected form after being crucified and being in the tomb and rising back to life. And one of these stories that I so love is the story of Peter, um, how, how Jesus appears to Peter and the disciples. And, and Peter is someone who has so much promise. I mean, really out of the disciples, he gets a really good rap from Jesus. He gets a really good encouragement from Jesus. Jesus speaks over him and says, you are the rock on which I will build my church. He says, even the gates of hell won't stand against that. I mean, come on, talk about some encouragement. Jesus is like, hey, you are the one that I am gonna build on. But after Jesus is arrested, it it kind of seems like Peter throws all this away. And we pick up the story in Luke 22, uh, verse 56, and Jesus has been arrested and he's, he's taken in, in, into the courtyard and he's, he's being questioned by these religious leaders and, and Peter tags along at a distance and, and sneaks in. And it says, a servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, this man was with him, as in Peter, this man was with him, with Jesus. But Peter denied it, woman, I I don't know him, he said. A little later, someone else saw him and said, you are also one of them, one of the disciples, one of the followers of Jesus. Man, I am not, Peter replied. About an hour later, another asserted, certainly this fellow was was with him, for he is a Galilean. Peter replied, man, I don't know what you're talking about. And just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. I mean, this is a pretty intense story. To, To deny Jesus three times is one thing, but we see there that, he, he basically denies Jesus three times in the presence of Jesus. It says Jesus looked over at him and he remembered what Jesus had spoken. It, like Peter, he's got such promise. He's got such a calling for his life, but, but here he is really betraying his, his Lord and his closest friend. And, and the number three in the Bible, it's actually symbolic of, of completion, of, of things being completely finished. It's it's hammering home the picture by saying that he denied Jesus three times, that it was complete and utter denial, that it was total denial. It says there he's, he's left heartbroken, weeping bitterly. It seems like surely there's no coming back from this. And I think if we're honest, we can probably all relate to this in some way. We might not have literally said the words, I don't know him, but, our, but we've all done actions that maybe betray the goodness of God, said something that we instantly regretted. Has anyone said, you've done that, right? You've said something and as soon as you hear your own words, you're like, I, I wish I could take that back. Maybe you did something that seemed catastrophic for your future, hurt someone, maybe not even something big, you just kind of woke up and realised this, this is not how I thought my life would look. Maybe just like Peter, you felt like there's such promise for my life and you used to be so passionate, so excited, so fired up. And maybe you're even sitting here this morning as we're singing, pour your spirit out and the, the passion's just not quite there. Jesus just doesn't seem to be the priority that he once was. And even in the midst of, I guess, all of this fresh hope, the stories of Jesus rising from the dead, the the stories of 
seeing Jesus. For Peter, actually having seen Jesus already in his resurrected form, Peter still seems a little bit lost. If you remember earlier in the story, Jesus, when he calls Peter, says, I'll make you a fisher of men. He's basically saying your purpose is people. But, but as, we see this, as we pick the story back up in John 21, he's returned to fishing for fish. It actually says in the Scripture, it almost puts it like Peter really didn't know what to do, so he just reverted back to what he always did. He went fishing. And in, in John 21, Jesus appears to them. They haven't caught any fish. He speaks to them. They listen. They get this miraculous catch of fish, and then they come back to the beach. And it says, when they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. I just, side note, love that that's Jesus' kind of first priority is let's eat. Um, None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus had asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. It's such a beautiful story. Three times Peter denies Jesus. Three times Jesus confirms Peter's calling. As surely as Peter had denied Jesus, Jesus restores Peter. He gives, G- he gives Peter the, the chance to replace his three denials with, with three affirmations of his love for Jesus. In the moment, it says Peter is hurt. Maybe because he doesn't see that this is complete and total restoration. This is what he had thrown away, being given back to him. Jesus reaching out and saying, you denied me three times, but let's replace that with three affirmations of my love because I am not done with you yet. God's not done yet. Restoration is defined as the action of returning something to a former owner, place, or condition. And can I encourage us this morning, no matter how far astray we might have felt like we've gone, no matter how much we might have felt like we've, we've missed the mark, we've dropped the ball, Jesus' heart is always for total restoration. I love that, not even partial restoration. It, it, it's total restoration, three times, complete denial, three times, completely restored. For every time you walk away, Jesus is creating a way back. He's in the business of restoration. No matter how bad, broken, how far gone, who's written you off, Jesus says, I'm not done yet. I love Romans 8.1. It says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's good news, right? There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. When we lived in Taipei, it was this world city, lots of big buildings. And often what they would do, it seemed weekly, shops would change. Like I would walk down the street outside our house and one day there would be a bakery and the next day it would be a clothing store. And the next day you'd walk past again and it would be some kind of fitness store. It was amazing. I don't know why, they're just always changing stuff around. Uh, always just new business in, new business out. The other thing that happened was buildings got condemned all the time. A condemned building is one that's no longer fit for use, right? They, they would condemn it because it's no longer safe to inhabit. It's no longer safe to live in. And the, really, it's good for nothing except pulling down. And I think sometimes we get this view of our life where we can condemn ourselves and think, I'm just too broken, I'm just too messed up, I'm just, there couldn't be any use for me. But Jesus says, there is no condemnation in me. You thought you were just good for pulling down? God says, I will put purpose in your life. He is in the business of total restoration. Maybe others have looked at you and said, 
something negative about you, about your life or, or what you could achieve or what God could do through you. There might even seem like there's areas of your life which are unrestorable. Can I encourage you? God's not done yet. Jesus is the king of life renovations. Has anyone ever taken on a renovation here? Where are, where are our renovation people? A few brave people. Yeah, Ambrose has got his hand up. He's done a few, yeah. You go into, you know, you buy, buy a house that oh, it's not quite there yet and then you turn it into something beautiful. And I think that that's what Jesus loves to do with our life. He, he looks at the rooms of our life and he says, I can do something with this. I can make this more beautiful. I can rewrite this story. I can change this narrative. He, he looks at our life and he sees hurt and he says, hey, where there's hurt, I'm gonna put healing. He looks at our life and he says, where there's hopelessness, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna change things around. I'm gonna put a bit of hope where there was hopelessness. I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna fix things around where there was fear, I'm gonna put forgiveness. Where there's failure, I'm gonna put future. Where there's betrayal, I'm gonna befriend you. Where there's pain, I'm actually gonna bring purpose. You could put it this way, if it's not beautiful, God's not done yet. If there's something in your life that's not beautiful, that's not restored yet, don't worry, God's not done yet. Because God's heart is total and complete restoration. It's to fix things and bring them back, not just to how they were, but to even better. He's in the business of renovations. He'd do great on the block, is all I'm saying. He'd, he'd nail that thing. Jesus has, has bridged that gap between where we are and, and where we wanna be. He, he's bridged the gap between my failure and my future. You might have heard the saying, build a bridge and get over it. Well, Jesus has built the bridge. <laughs> Jesus has built the bridge. Our job is just to step onto it. He's done the work at the cross. That was the bridge built. There is no longer anything that stands between you and God, but our response is to need to step onto the bridge. And in a moment, you can actually say yes to God restoring to you, to, to God restoring you. In a moment, you can start this journey of, of God taking broken pieces and putting them back together. In a moment, maybe you can decide to let God into a room of your life that that you've condemned and you've shut off and you've thought, God, you can do this work out here, but not in there, that, that one's a real mess. In a moment, God can start to work. Restoration is a moment. It's also a process. It also takes time. It's also a journey, but that can start today. And the thing is, Jesus doesn't just restore us from things. He also restores us to things. He doesn't just restore us from the mistakes we've made. He actually restores us to future, to purpose. He doesn't just fix broken things. He gives purpose to broken things. Jesus restores purpose. Again, to Peter, he'd said, you are the rock and on this rock, I will build my church. And then Peter seems to throw it all away and he comes back and he says to him, build the church, feed the lambs, feed the sheep, take care of of the flock. Jesus wants to restore purpose in your life. And can I be honest? Have you ever felt confused about purpose? Like, is it just me? Like, have you ever wondered and sat on a rock, what is my, what is my purpose? What's my purpose meant to be? I think it, it, it doesn't help that at times, purpose has kind of been talked about like it's this 10-step plan that falls out of heaven. Um, like God's got a plan and a purpose for you and it's very specific. It's very detailed. So be, beware of what you have for breakfast tomorrow because you don't wanna get off the plan and beware of, 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 of who you're talking to because you don't wanna get off the plan uh, that God has for you. He's got this very specific niche kind of purpose that you've got to work out and until you work it out, well, then you're basically lost. I don't know if you've ever felt a little bit like that. I think maybe a better way to view purpose is as a divine usefulness. Purpose is God has got a use for your life. Your life is useful. Purpose isn't just something that's out there waiting for you to achieve. Purpose is something right now. Purpose isn't a level to attain. Okay, I finally, I'm living in purpose. Purpose is a lifestyle to walk in today. It's something you can walk in today. Today can have purpose because Jesus loves to bring purpose 
even where it seems like there couldn't be a purpose. No matter what today looks like, what season you're in, you can live with purpose. Romans 8, 28 puts it like this. And we know that in all things, just pay attention to that, all things. Doesn't say good things, doesn't say perfect things, doesn't say all the right things. It says in all things, God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. He can put purpose in seasons, in moments that might seem meaningless. You might say, God, I don't have much. God, God, I'm not that gifted. That's okay. God can give you purpose. He sees you as divinely useful. He says, I can restore purpose. And the thing about purpose is, it's always about other people. Purpose is always about others. I find it quite amusing, and I've been guilty of this, of, of how self-absorbed I can get when I think about purpose. Like, yeah. it's, 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 it's almost ironic because purpose is all about other people. It's ironic how much I can make it about myself. Like, I've just got to work, I just got to work out my purpose. I just got to take some time out and work on me, figure out who I am, figure out what my purpose is, figure out how God's made me. I might just, you know, go take six weeks at Byron Bay just to sit and to breathe in the salt air and to just drink oat lattes and uh, only eat vegan, just to work out what my purpose is. I go work out what, what it is. And, and it's almost like sometimes in our worship, it, it's like, God, would you just show me my purpose? Give me my purpose. And, and I'm not saying that's bad. I'm just saying it's in the context of serving others that you'll work out what your purpose is. It's in the context of loving other people that you'll work out what your purpose is because your purpose is not about you. <laughs> your purpose is about other people. Your purpose is about establishing the kingdom here on earth. God doesn't just restore us for us. He restores us for the good of the kingdom. When, when God restores us, when He gives us purpose, when, when, we, when, we, when we sense that we're just walking in purpose, it's not just that we would be blessed, it's that the kingdom would be blessed. It's that our neighbours would be blessed. It's that our colleagues would be blessed. It's that our family would be blessed because actually I've discovered that I'm not trying to attain purpose, I'm walking in it today. And I really feel this morning that for some people, this morning could be a real kind of recommissioning of sorts where God would would show you that He really does still want to, for you to live a life with purpose, that your life really does have meaning still. And just like for Peter, for Peter in the word of forgiveness was the word of recommissioning, was a word of a new season, was a word of fresh calling. And just like that, I think this morning, maybe there's some people here and you're wrestling with some things and God wants to show you that He's, that he's built the bridge, that you're all good, that you are forgiven. But more than that, He's not just calling you to step onto this bridge, He's stepping you to, calling you to step over the bridge and cross the bridge and walk into purpose and walk into future and start bringing life to the people around you rather than just feeling like your purpose has been served. I just really sense that, that Jesus wants to refire some people's dreams this morning. That stuff that you, you laid aside, He wants to refire and refresh passions and, and purposes. Not, not just for building self, but for building the kingdom. Just where you thought it was done, God's not done yet. When you thought your purpose was served, God's not done yet. When you thought there couldn't be any more, God's not done yet. Jesus restores purpose. He doesn't just restore us from things. He restores us to things. There's actually a responsibility with restoration that I don't just come and just camp at the feet of Jesus and, and I'll, I'll sit here until He's put all the things right and fixed everything up. There's a responsibility that as Jesus calls us into restoration, we walk into the purpose that He has for us. And I think God's attitude is, I will fix you on the way. I'll put the things back together as you walk out purpose, as you walk out a life with intentionality. That's where Jesus fixes us and makes us whole and, and heals us. I think for some people, the Maybe God would say to you that, that your, your healing is in moving forward. It's not in sitting and waiting. And, and there's times where it's good to sit and wait, but there's other times where we've actually got to keep moving forward and God restores us on the way. I, I think of this time in, um, in Taiwan. 
I was, I was riding my bicycle because that was the only transport I had. And uh, it, it was wild, okay? The roads in Taiwan are wild on a scooter. On a bicycle, it's kind of next level because people care less about you for some reason. Um, kind of like in Australia, it's like cyclists are like less than human for some reason. They're not. They're people too. Uh, even if they're in Lycra, they, you know, we love them. We might not agree with them, but we love them. Uh, um, I remember this one time I was riding home, I'd been studying Chinese and I was riding home on kind of this major highway that I would ride on the side of and, and the chain came off of my bike. Now that's a relatively simple thing to fix, you just put the chain back on but as I, as I got the bike upside down it was like, I realised this was going to be a lot more difficult than I expected because somehow the chain had become wedged in the wheel. And for a good five minutes, I was standing, just yanking on this chain, just trying to get it out of the wheel. And, and I was getting, co- I was just covered head to toe in grease. And I remember getting so frustrated with this bike. Like, oh, why can't I just fix this? I wish that this was right. This is holding me up. I'm gonna be late home because this thing is broken. It's not how it should be. And, and I, I kind of went through the motions of, do I just leave it here? Like, what do I do with this? Because it was, it was so bad that the back wheel wouldn't spin, right? So it was not just like, I just pushed this home. And, and kind of in a bit of a huff, I decided, oh, well, I'll just, I'll semi-carry it home. And I, I start pushing it. And, and it would have been two, three minutes up the road. I came past a mechanic shop. And I just sung out to the mechanic inside, like, can you help me? And, <laughs> And he came out and he, and he looked at my bike and he, he got a screwdriver and just very easily fixed it. I thanked him and I went on my way. And I think sometimes that's just, it's a bit of a picture of how God works. Sometimes we feel broken, we fall flat on our face and our response is, I'm just gonna sit here until it gets better. I'm gonna sit here until God heals me. I'm gonna sit here until God fixes me. But I think sometimes we've just gotta pick ourselves up and keep moving forward because you break through, because you're healing, because restoration, it happens on the journey more often than it happens sitting in a moment of waiting. He fixes us on the way. He restores purpose. He also restores power. I think this is, the good thing, because it can feel overwhelming to think that there's all these big things that I have to do for God. 50 days after Peter denies Jesus, he has a transformational experience with the Holy Spirit. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. And Peter, who denies Jesus to a servant girl, to someone who has no power or authority, to someone, in, especially in that context, is of little importance. Peter stands up in front of, the, of a crowd of people who are accusing them of being drunk, of doing the wrong thing, of, of, of being reckless. Peter stands up and preaches. I love, I love what he preaches, Acts 2, 16 to 21. He says, no, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show them wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood and before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved." Man, what happened to Peter? Like he went from, I don't know that guy, to hey, all people, the Holy Spirit is for you. All people, God's gonna pour out His Spirit on you. If you call on the Name of the Lord, you will be saved. He stands and preaches. It says 3,000 people were added to their number that day. He's filled with this fresh power, this this fresh fire. In in the process of, of restoring a car, there's a point where you need to put an engine in it, right? And just before that point is a point where you have all of the parts, but none of the power. <laughs> you got it all you need for the car to run, but, but until you actually get that engine going, it can't go anywhere. And I think that's what the Holy Spirit is for us. We're called to big things. We're called to make a difference. We're called to, to live a life of purpose, but it can seem daunting can feel like we don't have the energy or the motivation, the inspiration. 
It, it, it can seem so daunting and, and so it should because I don't know about you, I want God to do something in my life that only God can do. I don't wanna get to the end of my life and be like, yeah, I could have done all that. Like, like doubt, was God at work in that? I wanna get to the end of my life and be like, that was only God. <laughs> that is the only way I could have done that stuff. It was not my strength, it was God. The good news is that God doesn't leave us to make, us, make it happen in His own strength. Zechariah 4.6 says, Not by might, nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord Almighty. Not by might, nor by power, but by my Spirit. It's good news. You don't have to do this alone. God wants to empower you. He wants to fill you with strength from the inside out. And I think that's what a touch of the Holy Spirit is. A touch of the Holy Spirit is, is where I just feel a bit meh and then all of a sudden it's like the fire's burning again. Come on, you've experienced that, right? You've experienced that as we, in a worship service or as somebody's been praying for you and what looked like it was dead comes to life again, where the passion that seems to have died out suddenly springs forth again. Peace returns, hope rises, boldness starts to overtake us. And, and I just really believe that, that the Holy Spirit's doing something new. Yeah. And as we're moving into this, I guess, I guess this season of Pentecost, you could see it. Obviously, we're gonna mark Pentecost Sunday when we get there. I've just got a sense that even in the lead up to that, that the Holy Spirit wants to do some really special stuff in some people's lives. And, and, and can I just encourage you, maybe you're here and and you haven't experienced that, can I encourage you, it's for you too. I think sometimes God does weird things, but we're definitely not pursuing weirdness. We're not worshipping weirdness. I really think that when the Holy Spirit touches us though, things shift on the inside. Externally, nothing might change, but internally, everything changes. Come on, somebody, you've experienced that, right? I'm not speaking to a room full of people who haven't experienced this. God touches us and something changes on the inside. And I think He's just gonna do something powerful and fresh. Because God's not done yet. He's not done with you yet. He's not done with me yet. He's not done with your situation yet. If it's not beautiful, it's not finished. God's not done yet. Would you stand with me this morning? God's not done yet. I think would you, for some people, would you hear that as if you were hearing it from God? He's not done with you yet. Where you've written yourself off, He's not done with you yet where you've said, it's not worth restoring me. God says, you're incredibly valuable. I will restore you because I see the value within you. He's not done with you yet. Maybe to help us apply with this, could we just wrestle with a couple of questions for a few moments? The first question is, are there any areas of your life that you have seen as unrestorable? So any areas of your life that you've seen as unrestorable? Maybe you hadn't categorised it as that, but this morning as I've spoken, there's a good chance that that's what you're thinking about. It's this thing that just, something I did, something that happened to me, it's just, it's, it's, it's unrestorable. There's no coming back. Can I just encourage, maybe it's time this morning to just trust God with that to just kind of open the door to that space and say, you know what, God, would you come and and do a little renovation? Would you come and make this beautiful, what what has been so painful? Are you willing to go on the journey? God can do a lot in a moment. Let's not discount that. God can do a lot in a moment. One moment with God, one word from God, things shift, things change. Internally, things move around. But, but a big part of restoration is, is the journey. It's actually allowing yourself to go on the journey of God restoring things. It's not things went right and all of a sudden they are. It's this process of God putting the broken pieces back together, taking the broken pieces and making a more beautiful artwork. And I just think this morning that maybe there's a, kind of a fresh Holy Spirit 
anointing to do the journey. And, and I can just sense some people, you're just on the edge of your seat. And it's like, oh, I've just, I've tried this before. Would you give God a chance? He's not done yet. He's not done yet. Are you ready to come and take a seat at the table? That's kind of how it started with Peter. It was an invitation to the table or an invitation around the charcoal fire. Come and sit and eat. An invitation to Peter to, to, to come as he was. And I think today you have that invitation. The invitation isn't if you fix yourself up enough for God, He will accept you. The invitation is right now, as you are, with your brokenness, with your failures, with how negative you feel, with your negative self-talk, with your depression, with your anxiety, would you come and sit at the table with Jesus? Would, would you take the first step in allowing Him to restore you, to, to come as you are, to take that seat at the table, to, to start that journey of God putting you back together. Jesus, we just, we thank You for Your presence. And I just pray right now all over this place that, that, that as people are taking that step, that they're, they're slowly opening the door of their heart back up. God, I thank You that You're trustworthy, that You who began a good work in me will be faithful to complete it. And we just thank You for Your restoration power this morning. Right now, right as people, right where people sit, and just as they decide to go on the journey, God, I pray for a perspective change, that peace would start to come, as they choose to trust you, that peace would follow, that peace would fill them, that peace would guide them. We thank you, God, that you don't just restore us, so that we're pretty to look at. You restore us for a purpose, and I just pray that that our eyes would be open to the need that's around us that we can meet, that we would find purpose in today, Sunday the 28th, we would find purpose. And then tomorrow, we'd find purpose. We thank You that You restore purpose and that You're not done with us yet. In Jesus' Name, Amen, Amen. Hey, and taking this journey, I mean, the first step obviously is, 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 is a step of deciding to go on the journey with Jesus. And, and that's what it looks like. And maybe you're here and you've never made that decision. You've never made a conscious decision of, I wanna go on a, on a journey of following Jesus. Can I encourage you? It's the best decision you could make. Not everything changes in a moment. Not everything goes from bad to good. But what it is, is a decision to go on a journey of allowing God to restore you, to bring wholeness and healing. And I think it would just be a miss to not give people an opportunity to do that this morning. So if we, if we would just close our eyes just for one moment. Just sometimes I think it's good to, to kind of have a physical reaction to maybe what's happening, an external reaction to what's happening internally. And if that's you here today and you're thinking, that's me, I wanna go on that journey. Maybe I've never done that. Or maybe I just really need to get back on board, back on the journey. Would you just shoot your hand up right where you are? Just so, I'd love to pray for you. I'm not gonna embarrass you. But this morning you're saying, that's me. I'd really like to start that journey of following Jesus. Yeah, see that hand over there? It's awesome, man. So good. Look across here just a little bit longer. Yeah, over there. So good. So good. Jesus, we just thank you for these people responding to you. And God, I just pray as you met Peter right where he was, that you'd meet these people right where they are that you'd start to fill them with a fresh hope, a fresh sense of purpose. In Jesus' Name, Amen.